Hello guys, Winston here. On my way across America, I made a quick stop over at Myers Woodshop in Arkansas. Ben Myers is a maker, woodworker, and a Shaboko owner, and he offered up his shop to me for a quick project on the road. And I already had a project in mind when I got there because I totally overplanned my road trip, even down to when and where I could do laundry. I had some linoleum blanks, and Ben had a logo, so we set about to try and make a stamp for him. I personally haven't played with Vectrex software before, but I know it's the go-to choice for a lot of people doing more artistic applications. So we took Ben's logo, flipped it, and dropped it into a spire. Coming up with a toolpath took a few minutes, with most of that time spent figuring out the interface and what feeds and speeds to use. I'm going to have to gloss over this part because I'm not familiar enough with any of the Vectric offerings to talk about the workflow, but I was pretty impressed with how easy and quick they made that process. We guesstimated the feeds and speeds and ran a test on the back of the stamp since we didn't want to ruin the linoleum side on the first shot. It turned out okay, but we knew it could be better. We played around with the step over and the feed rate and tried again on some scrap wood since we'd realized that more testing was necessary. When we finally got a cut that we were happy with, I dropped in a stamp blank, linoleum side up, and we crossed our fingers. The logo we cut wasn't very deep, maybe about a 30 second of an inch, but the details were definitely all there. Unfortunately, we didn't have an ink pad so we couldn't properly test out the stamp. Watered down acrylic paint just wasn't cutting it. But eventually, Ben did get a hold of an ink pad and sent me a shot of the stamp actually working, and I was pretty happy with that, but I wasn't satisfied. I had completely guesstimated my feeds and speeds and gotten lucky. There was no science behind how I approached that project. I wanted to come away from that experience with a linoleum machining recipe I knew would allow me to repeat this success. So after arriving in Los Angeles, I began doing some more testing. But before I could cut more linoleum, I needed a model and a toolpath, and I was fresh out of Aspire licenses. And that's alright, because I've always wanted to figure out how to replicate Vectrix V-Bit pocketing toolpath in Fusion 360. So let's start with a basic design. And instead of taking the obvious route by using my own logo, let's do Carbide 3D's logo. That way, I can knock out a video for their channel at the same time. Plus, it's symmetric about the y-axis, so I don't need to mirror the logo for it to stamp right. I took the Carbide 3D logo and extruded it outward from the face of my stamp placeholder model by 0.07 inches. Then, in the cam workspace, I applied an engraving toolpath to the inside of the C. For this to work, you'll want to make sure your tool is programmed properly. Fusion needs the tool to be identified as a chamfer mill or a spot drill. For the best results, you should also provide a tip diameter if you know it. Generally, V-bits don't come to a perfect point. They have a small flat at the tip a couple thou across. Most PCB engravers list this value, but you probably won't have this data if you're using a router bit style cutter. In the absence of this information, using a value of 5 thou is generally pretty safe. If you can actually perceive a flat with your naked eye, then use 10 or 15. Now, if you don't want your V-bit plunging as deep as it can until the taper touches both walls, you'll need to set a bottom height. In this case, if we don't, the V-bit will plunge through the linoleum and into the MDF backing block. The logo is 70 thou proud, so I'll set the bottom height as 70 thou lower than the model top. This results in a toolpath that traces around all the edges of the C and also notches out any sharp corners, but it leaves the middle of the C not fully cut out. So in order to clear that out, we need to come back with a pocketing toolpath. But pocketing toolpaths aren't compatible with spot or chamfer mills, so you'll have to duplicate whatever you set your V-bit as in the tool library as a tapered mill. Seems kinda dumb, but if you want to change it, go yell at the Autodesk people for me. If you want to cut out the middle of the C using a 2D pocketing toolpath, Fusion calculates pocket coverage using the tip diameter. This means the top of the pocket will be incorrectly cut out by the increasing radius of the V-bit. If you want to use a 2D operation, you need to use negative stock to leave of one half the diameter of your cutter at the tip. I know I'm cutting 70 thou deep, so using some basic trig and knowing that my cutter angle is 60 degrees, I calculated that I need to program in 0.0404 inches of stock to leave. And looking at the preview, I'm left cutting exactly where my engraving toolpath missed. You can also do this as a 3D pocketing operation and spare yourself the math, but if you save the 2D toolpath as a template, it's really not going to be that hard, and the calculation will be more efficient. In order to pocket out the area around the logo using a V-bit, I'm first going to engrave around the logo for maximum accuracy and then pocket out the rest of the area. But if I'm using a 2D pocketing toolpath and I select the area between the logo and the edge of my stamp body, when I apply negative stock to leave, I'm going to have margin around the outside of my stamp that's not pocketed out. In order to compensate for the stock to leave on the outside, I'm actually going to select a sketched boundary that's offset outward from the stamp by the same stock to leave margin, plus a little extra. 
Now I have complete coverage on the face of my stamp. With the details and linoleum all defined, I can do a simple 2D contour toolpath with a flat end mill to cut out my stamp from a larger block of stock. I'm using the Nomad's max RPM of 10,000 and a feed rate of 20 inches per minute. This is a little slower than examples you'll see later, but that's because you get really bad surface speed at the tip of the cutter. I use some double-sided tape to hold down my linoleum pad. I zeroed off the wasteboard and set my X and Y origin to an area just inside the bottom left corner of my stock. Then I hit run in carbide motion and watch the chips fly. Or rather, globs of linoleum. Around the edges, as the linoleum got thinner and thinner, you can see it noticeably deflecting. This is one of the weaknesses of soft materials. There's a limit to the resolution you can achieve in them before material deflection becomes a problem. This is why linoleum is a good compromise in hardness and pliability for stamps. Any softer and you would have trouble machining the material. If you have thin features in your logo, I would recommend three things. 1. Fatten up thin lines so that they're at least 1mm thick. 2. Consider cutting your features shallower so that they're less likely to cantilever over. 3. Use a V-bit so that the base of your features tapers out and is a little bit stronger. But the Carbide 3 logo is actually pretty chunky and you can cut it out using only flat end mills, so I wanted to test those out in linoleum as well. I made a new set of toolpaths using a 2mm single flute and a 132nd inch end mill. Usually, with tiny end mills and hard materials, I aim for a chip load measured in tenths, but linoleum is relatively soft so I want to ensure that I'm getting a proper bite in the material. So I'm doing a chip load of about 2 thou with a 2mm end mill, and about 1.3 thou with a 132nd inch. Again, I'm aiming for 10,000 RPM, I'm also cutting in multiple step downs to minimize stock deflection. For this run, things turned out great. In fact, it was several times faster since V-bits are terribly inefficient in pocketing. But there was still one variable I wanted to test, climb versus conventional. So I made yet another setup where I reversed my direction of cut. Between the two of them, the wall finish was a hair better on the climb cut stamp. I think that comes down to the fact that linoleum is crumbly at the microscopic scale, very much like cheese. If you're starting out your cut thin, you're going to have a lot of rubbing instead of shearing up front. You want to take a good size bite into the material to ensure that your chip has the structural integrity to rip away cleanly in one piece instead of tearing out in globs. Now I can only extrapolate this advice to the same types of general purpose end mills I'm using here. If you get a bleeding sharp, high polished end mill that can slice through linoleum like butter, things might be different. In that case, conventional might actually work and you'll be able to hold better dimensional tolerances. But I'll say this, if I ever find myself with a block of sharp cheddar on my CNC, I'm going to make sure my toolpads are programmed for climb cutting and not conventional. Also, I'm not sure when that situation would ever happen. But just to confirm to myself that I had a reliable recipe for linoleum, I ran this toolpath a couple more times. The stamps all turned out great. Not only do the cuts look good, but they function as expected. They imprint well, though you have to make sure you're stamping on a flat surface. The features in my stamp are pretty robust, which means the linoleum isn't going to conform very well to any surface deviations like soft rubber would. So overall, I think linoleum actually machines really well. I'd seen some questionable examples of stamps online that worried me, but this project turned out great. It's just a matter of finding a good reliable recipe that works for your material and machine. Before I sign off, just a quick PSA that I published a video on the Carbide 3D channel about how we've hopefully banished the arc error that sometimes happens when you run G-code from Fusion 360 on a Gerbil-based machine. Link to that will be provided down below or as a card. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC content.